It's a it's a, it's a different thing, and it is very nice to have uh, uh, senior alumni like you sharing time and uh, sharing your words of wisdom with us. And uh, and uh, I will like to congratulate all the students of uh, this 1921 batch, 2019-21 batch, for taking this initiative. Uh, physically, it is very difficult for us to come together because of these current uh, challenging times. So, this option and this op, this uh, you can say uh, availability of internet and connectivity wherever we are in whichever part of the country we are has made it possible. So, I hope that uh, the topic, which is very very dynamic from your side, uh, will give a lot of uh, knowledge to my students and uh, your uh, contemporary uh, communication with them will bring. a lot of change in the way in which they look towards reading and leading which is the theme of your topic and uh, i will also be very happy that you share this thing with them as i am also a very avid reader of readings over and above and beyond my subject which gives me a very holistic view of uh, uh, looking at things and ma- making it merge with my teaching and research areas so because of some uh, busyness of the schedule i may not be there for the whole time after this introduction i will be there for some time and then the students will take over Welcome, welcome, Purvani sir. Welcome once again. Uh, thank you, Doctor Sanchen, Pratik Sanchen. I think we have met one or two times uh, when I visited UK school okay, years okay, ago. Okay. Uh, Doctor Sir Lachutan was director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She retired uh, in two thousand thirteen. It is uh, that right. So she was my teacher. Uh, good, good, good. As was Professor Gopal Krishnan. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, dr patel uh, yeah, yeah, my yeah. director was dhawal mehta yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, margi was senior who was yeah. with you now she she was i think from uh, 88 90 or 87 89 batch or something some like that uh, around same time she, she was yeah. the one year senior to me yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. it is my honor to join you uh, and thank you for your kind uh, introduction i look forward to talking to students So, yeah. Please, I will start when you give me your signals. Yeah, yeah. Please just tell me, okay. uh, just introduce sir, and then we can proceed. Okay. Sure, sure. Perfect. Okay. So, so I'll introduce you, professor, and then we can begin the session. Okay. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it is a beautiful evening, and uh, thank you all for being here. So, we welcome Dr. Uh, we welcome Professor Kodwani here, who is a very proud alumnus of BK School of Professional and Management Studies. So, on behalf of this institute. Uh, i welcome you sir and uh, professor kodwani is an executive dean of business and law at the Op- uh, open university united kingdom he is also the head of business school at the open university uk uh, he has also previously served at the director as the director of tolan institute of management in gujarat so we welcome you sir and uh, this virtual stage is all yours thank you uh, uh, pray pray that uh, uh, i must first of all Uh, compliment and congratulate the key school alumni and school student council and uh, uh, about that you are doing very important to stay connected with uh, uh, your contemporary but also past students uh, who have had the privilege of uh, uh, studying at the key school so uh, one of the things uh, uh, let me get out of the way is the, the Um, expectation gap that might be there. So this is all about uh, uh, my view of what I think about learn uh, learning in general, and in that the um, the role of reading. So I was recently listening to a, a an African Ghanaian writer, and uh, she said that uh, her chances of Uh, giving a speech she was giving in Toronto uh, at a very prestigious event where she had won a big prize for popularizing reading in Africa. Uh, she said the chance of her being in that position uh, 
statistical probability was very low because she came from a very uh, deprived area of the world in Ghana, you know, poverty and uh, poor country and so on. And uh, she said that only reason she was there was uh, because of the reading that she had done in life, which had allowed her to uh, be, to, uh, you know, grow in life and uh, um, and read and then come up and she actually won uh, Harvard Business, Harvard University scholarship and uh, uh, then came up in life and did wonderful things and, and now she popularizes uh, uh, reading of uh, uh, books in Ghana and she is just the writer. So for me to say that my probability of my talking to you today, if I were to look back from my childhood uh, and be where I am today and so on, is very low. Uh, but I have made that possible because uh, I am here partly because of the reading. Uh, and reading has played a very wide role in my life. So this is that's the reason I chose this topic. Now let me start by uh, thank you and few um, promises. So I'm going to share with you. Uh, it's not a death by PowerPoint, <laughs> so it is going to be uh, a few slides. Uh, so now I am uh, blind to what you can see, Preet, uh, Preet so you'll have to nudge me uh, if there is any question. So, okay, sure. You had chosen to be here uh, to listen to what I am going to say. Instead, you could have chosen to watch television, to meet friends, to go for a walk, to spend time with your family, to go to a gym, or to listen to music, or just lie down. But by choosing to be here, you have honored me. The honor is ours, sir. You have present. Your presence here tells me that you consider what I may say is worth listening. So thank you. Now to promises. You are a stock of wisdom. May not become larger at the end of this talk, but my first promise is that you will say, see some new connections. Some of these connections will stay with you in your memory. Others will be invisible to you, even as memories. These are connections that are formed in the brain as synapses within brain. Whenever they receive new information, they make those connections. Synapses are the cells that transmit impulse between nerves in brain. Human brain with, with its 100 billion neurons transmits all the time this information and then starts making the meaning of world. It makes connections between words and things that we see, listen to, experience. Also, it creates association between not just words and images or other objects, but also association between associations. So while our conscious memory, your conscious memory may help you to recall the association at some future time, your unconscious mind may create association between associations without your knowledge. So one promise is that you will see many possible connections in words, language, history, writing, and human societies. This is part one of my talk. And I called it written words, stories we live by. I also come back to brain in the last segment of my talk. 
In second part, I will talk about boundaries. What they mean, what they do to human understanding and our relation to nature, our relation to other non-human organisms and indeed to relations among humans. I call this crossing boundaries. Borrowing title from the book of the same title by economist Albert Hirschman, who saw more possibilities in economic theories than the problem of a scarce resource to be allocated rationally. I will reflect on the notion of boundary to note how pervasive is the human tendency to draw boundaries. This tendency has helped humankind make progress in some ways, but has also caused misery for humans and other species as well as for this planet. Human curiosity and perseverance to make sense of our place in nature and other, other fundamental questions is found in writings of adventurers, explorers, and others as they go about surveying landscapes of plains, deserts, mountains, glaciers, and oceans. There are writers who roam about to the farthest corners in the deepest forests to observe and understand tribes, languages, cultures, and much more. I will mention only few of such books that await you were you curious to go on adventure with any of these wonderful narrators. So my second promise is that by end of this talk, you will think about boundaries in more ways than you think about boundaries as symbols of sporting regulations on the fields of cricket, football, and tennis. My third promise is to look at myths, metaphors, and cognition. Now, this is a fascinating inward looking journey that humankind has taken on trying to understand mind and what that has revealed to us. So we'll reflect briefly on some of those things. And then finally, the fourth part will look at meaning and hope in such a way as to see opportunities and to celebrate human resilience. Finally, I promise that you will find something new in a new bottle or something in something old in new bottle or something new in old bottle. It will depend on your bottles of imagination memories and knowledge that you carry in your mind and whether these bottles are open or shut or if there is any space left in them. So now before I go to written words and stories we live by, I hope I still have your attention. If so, then it is a time for you to respond to a quick question that Preet, if you can put in the text box, yes, and sir, that sure. should you lead you to a place, uh, something like uh, write, write name of a book you are currently reading. So if I stop sharing this and then come back to sharing other window, you should be able to see uh, what you are typing in there.
Okay, so the last link in the chat box is for the question. So please go to the link and answer to the question. So, Prit, can you confirm that what is visible is active pole? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we have got one response. Yeah, please do not worry. Uh, it won't show your names or anything. Keep coming. Thinking fast and slow. Interesting. It is relevant to metaphor, myths, and cognition topic. We'll talk about that. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen and go back to sharing the slide and continue talking. Please to keep putting your um, answers there if you wish to. So I hope now we are back to PowerPoint. Great. OK, yeah, it's visible now. OK. So to give time and attention to someone or some idea or some place is to say that we love someone, we respect someone, uh, we find something worthy. Attention is a beautiful noun. To attend means to apply your mind to something, to someone. Root of the word attend is Latin word tender, which means to stretch. I enjoy reading about language and writing. A language con consists, it contains words, and words have origins. Mm. Hence, my interest stretches quite naturally into words and their origins, too. Stories behind words, origins of words, reveal fascinating details about histories, places, people, birth, life, universe, and so on. Consider word juggernaut. You may know the meaning of uh, juggernaut as something huge, moving and unstoppable force. Sometimes we say bureaucracy is juggernaut, or a large corporation like Google as juggernaut in digital economy. There is an interesting story behind this word juggernaut. There's a famous temple of Jagannath Puri in town, eastern town of India, Orissa. Every year, four deities of Jagannath temple travel in four large chariots from one temple to another and return after nine nights. Thousands of devotees pull chariots through the streets of Puri town. Over time, this massive procession of Lord Jagannath has come to be associated with some massive, unstoppable force, object. This is a story of how the name of Lord Jagannath acquired meaning in English language as Jagannath. If we consider the meaning of word Jagannath in Hindi, it provides different insight also. Two Sanskrit words, Jagat and Nath, are combined to make up Jagannath. Jagat is used to describe world or universe, and Nath is to describe Lord or 
uh, husband, caretaker, it has many meanings in Hindi. But here it is Lord. So Jagannath is Lord of Universe. Beauty of Sanskrit is found in the word Jagat though. It is made up of two words, Ja and Gat. Ja means that which and Gat means changing or moving. So the literal meaning of Jagat is that which is moving, that which is changing. Now that is word we use for universe, which is a very close meaning in theoretical physics of the word universe, because they say universe is cyclical, it is moving, it is changing all the time. So, so this word has got uh, such a wonderful connotation. We see words being made all the time. So as the debate on Britain exiting UK uh, Union, European Union was going on, it gave birth to Brexit. In past few weeks, we have seen introduction of new word COVID made up from coronavirus disease. There is a French word for blending new words by combining words. It is portmanteau. This fondness for linguistic cocktails that has created word pheromone from two Greek words pharo and hormone, which means stimulating. Think of fragrance, for example. It's a stimulant. Many insects and animal secret pheromone to communicate. We use gestures, voice, words, facial expressions to communicate between us humans. And also we use artificial means like phones, digital technologies to amplify our reach uh, uh, in time and space and to take messages. While pheromones are chemical messengers, Limited to carry message in a space sense, but they do perform many practical functions for animals. There are many types of pheromones. For example, aggregation pheromones are used by queen, fire, ants, and other insects to attract males. The queen fire ant, for example, flies about fast after releasing that pheromone to attract males and she would fly about very quickly fast until she finds some ant which can fly faster than it can so that it can choose the fittest, strongest male and partner. And then they have uh, um, then then they meet in air actually the air mating takes place in flight actually and then queen ant lands and starts a colony of ants by laying eggs and it lays eggs of infertile ants who are just workers slaves because they cannot reproduce this is quite odd one if you think in terms of darwinian sense of survival of the fittest because the the fittest ant may take but then it would not reproduce itself it will just reproduce through that ant and queen ant decides what kind of uh, other ants are produced to create what is called a super organization, organism. So ants, if you see, they have a colony of ant is now being argued as a super organism. It lives as a super organism, not just individual ants. And there are lessons to be learned from this, as we see. The social behavior of ants has been studied by many entomologists. However, Edward O. Wilson, a professor retired now from Harvard, dedicated most of his working life of six to seven decades to study of ants and put ants in the center of attention and started scientific field of sociobiology. He wrote a book in 1975 called Sociobiology. Quite very, very controversial at that time that human societies might be mimicking or might have learned uh, the social behaviors from the animals. He described ant society in great detail, but also reminded us that we have a long way to understand life on Earth. 
and how it, how it organizes itself in different species. I quote, with most species yet undiscovered and the vast majority of those yet uh, those known yet unstudied, most biological phenomena are probably also unknown and unimagined, unquote. But consider the length we had to go after what we know already from work of biologists, naturalists, and others. As we note Wilson's description of ant societies, I quote, in the absence of a central control, all functions of the superorganism emerge from the self-organization of dozens of dozens to millions of competent colony members. Food is obtained and distributed appropriately to all colony members. The territory is gained and defended. A nest of appropriate size and architecture is excavated or constructed. Brood are moved within the nest to track a favorable microclimate. Workers move to the appropriate region of the nest or territory as their jobs change with age. Investment in sexual versus workers is seasonally adjusted and mating flights are properly timed and organized. Now that says a lot about what we know about ants, but Wilson says we have not even scratched the surface of understanding life on Earth. So what I learned from this is to be humble. Do not pretend we know a lot. Let me for now turn from standalone words to words we use in conversation. So tu, tum, aap, these three words we use, also, we use all the time in Hindi and Gujarati. So tu, tum, and aap are three pronouns in Hindi language for English pronoun, you. Tu is used in informal conversation as between friends you will be using. So when talking to a close friend, we use informal pronoun tu as in tu chal mere saath meaning you come with me. But in a formal conversation, we use tum, as in tum chalo mere saath, meaning you come with me again. Talking to an elder, one would say aap, and as we say aap chalo mere saath, meaning again same, you come with me. So tu, tum, and aap convey shades of formality in relationship. In French, there are two words for you, tu and vu. The former less formal and the later more formal. Thai language though has seven different ways to say you. The seven words convey different grades of formality, which are perhaps rooted in the cultural past of Thai society which was highly stratified. Thailand is not only society which has had some sort of classification of people. All over the world, human societies have divided people based on economic status, status of social standing, or myths like caste, creed, and races. I will return to this when I talk about boundaries later. Here, let us stay with some use of different words to for pronoun you and what it is it has taught to me. I realized language may offer clues to cultural manners about relationships when I was reading a book titled The Language Hawks by John McWerther. Mm -hmm. My Lord and My Lady used in court to address judge, uh, a judge in court signify respect and authority of the position of judge. In their meaning, words carry ideas, emotions, information, and concepts. Capitalism, racism, patriot, brave, sick, and soothing are all likely to arouse an emotion conveyed by the meaning of these words. However, it occurred to me only when reading a passage in the language hoax that use of different words for you may show some how power is exercised in society. 
over a long period of time, many hundreds of scholars in wide range of academic disciplines, including sociology, anthropology, psychology, politics, management, and others have inquired into the question of what power is and how it is exercised in human societies at large or and in small units in which humans organize life and work such as family, corporation, government. Zoologists, biologists and other specialists who study behavior of non-human organisms tell us that power is not a unique phenomenon in human societies. I already told you about the queen ant. It is found in other species too. Indeed, alpha male term, which we use in corporate jargon also, is drawn from behavior of a strong, successful leader in pack of chimpanzees and other primates. Anthropologist, anthropologists gave us that word, uh, sorry, primatologists. In reverse flow of analogy from human conception of power in word king, we have lion king as a king of jungle, queen as a bee in a honeycomb, and in these slave ants, as I talked about in and colonies. So you can see the power flows through whole range of organisms, be those human animals or others. I was doing Bachelor of Commerce degree in early 1980s in Ahmedabad. In my first visit to library of my college in Ahmedabad, I found that books were kept in locked steel cupboards with glass pans. I wanted to browse subject related books before borrowing what I wanted to borrow. I asked the assistant to open the cupboards. The library assistant told me to first select books from catalog, only then he would open the cupboard. Citing a college regulation, the library assistant refused to open the cupboard on my request. I left the library. I spoke to a lecturer about the situation. He advised me to buy the prescribed textbook as these would help me to do well in the examination. I had seen, I had seen textbooks. They were dull and in some cases contained mistakes. My college was near Gujarat Vidya Peet that Mahatma Gandhi had founded almost 100 years to the today's date in October 1920. The library of Gujarat Vidya Pit is open to local community. It is one of the best libraries I have seen in India. It has over 650,000 books. That is one book for about eight or nine residents of Ahmedabad. While we are on numbers, two other numbers must be mentioned. The library remains open 364 days of the year. Only on first day of Hindu calendar Vikram Sambat, it is closed. Vikram Sambat year started about 56.7 years before Gregorian calendar year that we follow started. Currently, therefore, it is Vikram Sambat 2076, I think and it will move to 2077 in March next year. Nepal uses Vikram Samad as national calendar. The other number is 1,619. According to the library's website, it had 1,619 active members in 2016-17. I remember paying annual membership fee that was smaller than the cost of watching a couple of movies in morning shows. You may not know, but there used to be morning shows in the uh, cinemas in Ahmedabad. And so which we would go to watch occasionally when the classes became unbearable. A good library fuels imagination and sense of discovery. What then explains such a small active membership at Vidya Pit Library in a city of close to six and a half million people? Is it to do with the archaic regulation in school and college libraries? Is it untrained library staff? It is, is, it educa is, it, is it education system that over relies on examination and assessment? 
which force you to go through prescribed poorly written textbooks. So what is behind this? Or is it colonization of mind by silly chats and time that social media are the dreadful combination of audiovisual and media that traps our attention? It is perhaps all of these that explain why a treasure house like Gujarat Vidya Pit Library does not have many active members. Thanks to the poor imagination of my college authorities and tinted view of about the purpose of library that the library assistant had, my college lecturer's view, I discovered a better library. The reading hall in library as you go in is huge. I always felt humbled in presence of ocean of knowledge inside library, which was furnished simply, but was fit for serious studies with sitting capacity of 350 people. Large windows let natural light in. There were many trees surrounding library. Screaming peacocks in gardens of the Vidya Peet compound would occasionally break the silence in library. The bookshelves were open and at accessible height. One day with no particular title in mind, I was browsing philosophy section when I found a book titled The Worldly Philosophers by Robert Heilbronner. It took it in the book Heilbronner sketched intellectual biographies and contributions of great thinkers who have come whom we have come to call economists. The thinkers included Adam Smith, Thorstein Weblin, Karl Marx, Joseph Schumpeter, and so on. Reading of the books Reading of the books was a serendipitous encounter with economics in philosophy section of the library. Weblin's unconventional approach to explaining consumption choices by mixing sociological and anthropological interpretations of human choice struck a chord inside me. I realized that individual's economic behavior could not be understood through diagrams of marginal utility curve only and India's economic development through a study of five year socialist plan that we were being taught in the college at that time. The open access libraries are in tune with the wandering human mind. We get about 4,000 thoughts in a day, according to a scientific study on daydreaming and fantasizing. Thought flow and motivation by Professor Eric Klinger. Average length of thought is about 14 seconds. Nearly half of these thoughts are wandering minds, undirected thinking that Eric Klinger calls daydreaming. Letting mind wander may facilitate creative problem solving, argued Benjamin Baird and others in a book, a paper called Inspired by Distraction, Mind Wandering Facilitates Creative Incubation. While libraries organize the books and journals systematically and carefully, carefully designed open access libraries allow a curious visitor to wander among company of great writers, sitting on shelves, always ready to shake hands and take an intellectual walk with the readers. Now I'm going to move to crossing boundaries. And perhaps it is time for a second question, Preet, here. Uh, just see what sure. comes to your mind when you think about this word boundaries. Sending the second question. Okay, the link will take you to the second question. Okay, 
I hope it is showing something now. If people are typing. Okay, yeah, it's showing. Uh, sorry. Okay. Is it visible to people now? Yes, it's visible. Okay. I haven't seen any voting closed. It says it should not happen. Now it would be let me reload. Okay, I think it is uh, not getting ah okay limits fretters okay yeah. glass ceiling in our minds of sign work on okay mean to be broken confinement okay Great. So I'll I'll stop it here. I please continue typing if you want, and I'll I'll bring up the screen again. Uh, but let me stop sharing this and then get back into the talk. Uh, so it, it will be on. You can continue to type. It. I think it should not be a problem. So let me see if it is. Preet, is it back on the PowerPoint? Passing boundaries. Yeah, it's loading. Okay. Okay, now it's visible. Right. So, as you were saying in your responses, a boundary implies a notion of a barrier, some sort of ring we create around it. Now, you know, people travel. So, here I want to talk about a few of the things that have inspired me to read about um, and how I have interpreted notions of. Uh, boundaries I call physical, natural, social, and intellectual boundaries and how they enrich your experience of living. So if you see one of the things that is shown on the screen is uh, uh, on the right side, I would see Al-Baruni's India. Now this was a book written about 1000 years ago. About 1000 years ago, Abu Rayyan al-Biruni lived in, he was in India actually at that time. But he was born in 1973 AD and then uh, when he was about 45 years old, he accompanied the, the, the uh, invader, Islamic invader, Muhammad Ghaznavi to India. And uh, he, he was accompanying him as an astrologer. So he traveled to India with uh, Ghazni in about 1017 as his astrologer. He was a scholar. Uh, Al Baruni was a scholar who knew many languages Persian, Hebrew, Syriac, uh, Arabic, uh, Greek. And when he came to India, he studied Sanskrit and became a scholar in Sanskrit. Actually, he translated Patanjali Sutra from Sanskrit to Persian. Uh, and uh, some of the Puranic books he translated as well. But he wrote his epic, uh, Al Baruni's India, which is his, uh, his travels in India. And he says in the book, uh, actually, you can find an electronic copy of the book. Uh, it's rare to get the physical copy, uh, that 
how India was at that time. Now, if you think of boundaries of time and uh, space, here is a book which was breaking, first of all, traveling to India and then spending time and breaking the cultural barriers that he encountered. He actually traveled and uh, spent many years. It took him 13 years to write this book. Um, and he describes many things in that about the Indian society at that time. Remember, by that time, there were already Christians in India, there were Muslims in India, and of course, there were rest of Indians who had been there before arrival of Christians and, uh, uh, and uh, Islamic uh, culture. So he studies, uh, so he gives you a window into India from an impartial perspective of somebody who comes as a, uh, as a visitor, he was a polymath. He well versed in astronomy, physics, mathematics, medicines, um, and uh, traditions of uh, Sufi Islam, of the Greek philosophy, studied Greek mythology, and he finds parallels between many mythologies. Uh, he doesn't say, but there's an, a mythology story, for example, one of the uh, stories, mythological stories in Greek is a story of Atlanta, for example. Now, Atlanta was uh, uh, was uh, it's, it's a story okay so she was born to a greek king and who wanted son so he didn't like a daughter arriving you can see the gender bias going 2000 years back so he discards his daughter to jungle when his son is born he abandons daughter to jungle and this daughter somehow survives okay again there is a goddess to save her artemis who gives brings a bear to feed the child and then later on child is picked up by hunters hunters and then she grows up like Mowgli in Jungle Book. She grows up in the jungles and becomes a very powerful huntress, a lady huntress and uh, she runs very fast. So when she grows up, somehow she finds way back to King and he accepts her daughter, but she's now grown up. She wants, he wants her to marry. And she said, I don't want to marry. She has seen that all hunters, male hunters were poor to her in hunting skills and so on. And she said, when she was persuaded, okay, she said, okay, I know what I will do. I'll listen to my father and put such a condition that he would not find a match for me. So she said she would marry a person who can outrun her in race. She was the fastest runner. Now, when you read this story, it reminds you of Sita in Ramayana and Rupadi in, um, in uh, Mahabharata who organized their own swayam wars, you know, they uh, are competition. So there's a fascinating connection between the mythology in Greek mythology and Indian epical uh, mythologies. Uh, but he talks about some of those things. Now it gives you perspective that how cultures talk to each other, uh, this exchange of knowledge and uh, discussions and discourses was very common in human societies. So when you see these days uh, barriers coming in way of exchange of ideas, you wonder if those barriers always existed, would we have evolved in any way as a social system on any part of the planet? So he wrote about 146 books of which 90 were about scientific things. Journeys to West reminds me of uh, Yuang uh, Tang. You all might have studied a Chinese monk, Buddhist monk traveling to India. Um, in 5680 AD and then going back to China with a lot of uh, Buddhist scripts and then translated those in China. So journey to waste is actually not from, you know, it's from China to waste, which is India. So this is a, this is a, a fictional historical novel, which was written in 1600. And it's a full, uh, it's a huge novel of about a uh, uh, um, hundred chapters. And uh, now it is condensed by Professor Anthony Yu from Chicago University into four volumes, which also is about 1,800 pages. So this is a fascinating story of how cultures and ideas travel between regions. Uh, and uh, in this, actually, the earlier translation of this was called uh, uh, Journey to the Waste Monkey, because uh, the characters in this story include one a uh, monkey, and then you would find a lot of parallel with the story of Hanuman and Ram here. But more, more uh, uh, social type of travels and journeys that we see. So, you know, Charles Darwin went on um, a ship 
uh, beagle uh, to uh, go around and collect uh, species and so on. His companion book was written by uh, Alexander Humboldt. So this invention of nature book, which is a recent uh, book about Alexander Humboldt, uh, reminds me of how even Charles uh, Darwin was inspired by Humboldt's book, which were written in 18th century, 17th, 18th century. And he was a great adventurer who went to South America and traveled for five years to scale uh, difficult mountain terrains, but classified mountains and so on. So um, gave us a lot of knowledge, holistic. So far, when I read uh, Alexander Humboldt, I find he was first environmentalist who took the holistic view of what we call today biodiversity, the concept uh, fam made famous by actually Wilson. But if you read him, you find that this person was able to look at the holistic picture and tell us that world is the planet is fragile. The creatures on the planet are fragile, even though they look strong. And therefore, we need to look after them. And he uh, uh, almost by 10 feet, 15 feet uh, gap, he was uh, monitoring on a mountain hill uh, the gap differences between the vegetation, the animals he was in. He detailed, made detailed notes of it. So it's a fascinating journey of, of five, five years. And he almost died on the way. Uh, and he narrates that story, which is what Charles Darwin found very inspiring when he was uh, thinking about the nature. Tuzo Wilson, Jock Tuzo Wilson took another journey uh, from Russia to China. So to, to, uh, Tuzo Wilson, you would not know, he, he is the first geophysicist, what we call geologist, geophysicist, who studies the tectic, tectonic plates and tells us about the, the structure of uh, our crust, Earth's crust, and tell, earthquakes and so on are explained by this uh, science. But he um, went to Russia in 1958 on what was called Inter International Geophysical Year. First year when an international conference took place, bringing together all these scientists who were studying new field of geophysics. And from there, he travels to China and studies how people in China have been looking at science. The message I get from something like that is how people want to think about and understand and who are after knowledge they are not bothered about boundaries. You can imagine traveling from Canada via Europe to other side of Iron Curtain in Soviet Union. And from Soviet Union, he takes a eight day journey via Siberian, Trans-Siberian train um, from Moscow to Peking. Eight days it took him by train. And he wanted to see how land looked from train because he was a geologist. So he was interested in looking at that and said, in, what would have taken him eight hours of flight? He takes eight days journey. Again, here is a quest, human quest, which does not worry about these physical boundaries because their purpose is to understand what lies beyond these artificially invented maps and boundaries uh, because globe is not humanly created. Boundaries are not globe. And then let me quickly talk about Bay of Bengal and uh, Call of Sea. So these books are very interesting in two ways for me. One is Bay of Bengal talks about the bay on the east side of uh, our peninsular country. And Call of Sea talks about the west side, the Arabian seas. And these two books talk about how people between continents traveled and exchanged and did commerce. So Kachi traders went from a Kutch site to Africa okay, Mozambique, Kuwait, and Middle East for trading, why would they travel and take hardships in uh, um, 8th century, 9th century, 10th century, and 15th century, difficult times because the climate was not suitable? So this tells you that a lot of migration that happens in people is driven by the climate. And again, we are facing a climate uh, migration crisis uh, in coming years. So climate refugees are going to be a reality. And same is happening in Bay of Bengal. Uh, it used to be before the arrival of European imperial powers, Bay of Bengal was the major commerce uh, region. It was a region full with economies uh, trading between India and uh, um, the Southeast Asia countries, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, Burma, and so on and so forth. So 
this was a, a, a journey, but also uh, there's a very interesting story in this book uh, of uh, uh, Palani Sami Kumaran, who traveled from Indian side to Malaysia in 1937, and then war broke out. And his experience of uh, living there, so he lived through four times when the nation changed its name. So it was when he went to that part, it was Federated Malayas, okay, the Confederation under uh, uh, under uh, you know various uh, regimes, Portuguese, British, French, and so on. Then it became Japanese Malay because Japanese. So that. And then we had British Malays, Malaysia, and then we had independent Malaysia. Now, if you have lived that long, your identity as a national has changed three times, four times. Who, what do you call that person's identity? And this brings into the question of whole notion of what we call nationalism, okay? Uh, there's a debate going on uh, all over the world. What is nationalism, for example? And if you read uh, Tagore's book on nationalism, it opens eyes at how many warnings he gave to Japan when he traveled to Japan that don't take such no view of the nationalism, it will destroy you and in the end it did destroy Japan. So I'll move on from that uh, to, uh, to a few other things on the boundaries. So they're not only these boundaries which are based on travel but also these intellectual and uh, cultural boundaries. I want to mention three of them here. So I mentioned the book called Worldly Philosophers and uh, how that introduced me to, uh, to economics. But then these days uh, there's a, 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 I mentioned Albert Hirschman, he is now uh, no more, but a, a great book was published uh, honoring him in his work called Worldly Philosopher, worth reading if any of you are. The reason I mention Hirschman is because he trespassed intellectually from economics to see economics in a much wider context, okay? So we tend to think of economics in a narrow sense, but it was Hirschman who said that context matters. You can't simply apply the policies and principles from the textbook of any theory to uh, any context. And we have several examples of that in management theories as well as in economic theories. So for me, Hirschman, is a kind of a reminder, do not overgeneralize. Benedict Anderson again uh, talks of like Hirschman, but he talks of uh, anthropology, that how you cannot interpret cultures from a textbook, from an episode, from a popular notion. You need to really engage with the culture to understand its differences rather than generalize. And we, we have this tendency to create this artificial short uh, and uh, smart boundaries, but actually they are detrimental when you start categorizing cultures and people. And um, Beyond Belief, which was in V.S. Naipaul's uh, travel book in, when he went to Pakistan after many years, he was shocked to see how it had transformed itself from a a community that was very liberal and a different view of religion than what he was experiencing. Again, people had started creating those boundaries and barriers and becoming their world very narrow. Okay, And finally, Gora. What can I say about Gora? Gora is a, is a very short book. If you get a chance to read Life and Times of Gora, uh, do read. Gora was born in 1902 and uh, he was a um, radical social reformer uh, in the early part of 20th century who was very well respected by Gandhi uh, and he was an atheist. He wanted to break the barriers of castes uh, and social hierarchies in India and uh, he was a master. He had studied uh, zoology and biology. He became a botanist. He got MA actually in that time uh, in Madras. So Gora reminds me of the power of knowledge to see through the, the shallow barriers that we create in society and cause misery to others. And uh, uh, when his second, son, second, second child was born in 1930 and Gandhi had just launched the SART movement, uh, you know, Gandhi March. So he, he named his child as Lavanam, which means uh, uh, SART. You know, Lavanam is Telugu word, Telugu word. In Sindhi, we call it Loon uh, and, and Namak. So, so Gora for me is a symbol of uh, uh, seeing through the unity behind the diversity, the visible diversity. So that is where I 
have uh, decided to stop uh, discussion on cross bound crossing boundaries click on to myth myths and metaphors we are complex human species mind is very complex so there's a lot of information coming through the uh, neuroscience these days that tells us that we think of ourselves as rational but we may not be because the choices that we make can be easily influenced and manipulated by the way the choices are presented to you so when you read sheena ayengar's book it's a fascinating book as a business student you would like to read it the art of choice and a uh, uh, book called uh, the paradox of choice that excess choice actually complicates matters it spoils our decision making ability so um, there's a lot of marketing research saying that if you have more than six choices you make sub optimal choices okay so that is happening because of the cognitive load on your mind to process lot of choices creates a sub optimal solution for you um, internet and many companies design contracts like if you try to imagine comparing two telephone contracts with a mobile phone contracts they will give you so many parameters to compare you will get confused so you will go for a heuristic somebody had mentioned at top of the top uh, thinking fast and slow that book is a fascinating book tells you about how heuristics dominate our decision making not necessarily very deliberate choices uh, all this is started uh, at a fundamental level i find this fascinating book called descartes, descartes a french philosopher in 16th century who separated the notion of mind from body and that mind is separate and body is separate therefore you can use reason you can do rational analysis and uh, emotion is not important and so on but today it is being challenged by uh, people like antonio demosio who say that emotion and reason coexist you can't separate them so you need to be careful and that is where i find um hans uh, olings book factfulness approach to be guided by evidence very helpful um but we do continue to make myths and meaning out of myths metaphors and if you want to really understand how popular discourse could be uh, presented in a way that could actually influence your choices even in democratic setup you need to look at george black of political mind um and sociologist uh, uh, claude levit strauss's books uh, who have analyzed how that public opinion could easily be swayed by creating a metaphor by creating a myth so you hear word of uh, fatherland motherland so you are by talking about a nation as a father and mother you are introducing family concept and therefore implied mother father authority over the person as a citizen so citizen is not a son or a daughter citizen is a citizen so uh then you come to expect of doing things for the mother or father and and so on and um 21 challenges in 21st century by harari the famous author of the sapiens one of the myths he talks about is the concept of nation for example the concept of money so we need to be careful that how our mind uh is uh, seen as rational but it is quite vulnerable to manipulation by way we are framing okay in cognitive psychology they use the word framing the cognitive biases so framing anchoring some of these are key biases that influence our decision making a uh, final part of the talk and this will take not more than 5 minutes i would hope so so that you can ask any questions human beings go through all kinds of problems uh and some of the most difficult situations give us meaning so here what you see i will never see it, the world again is the latest uh, recent book actually came out few months ago by ahmed altan who is in prison in turkey uh, for making noise about democracy and the authoritarian regime of turkey has put him behind bars without much explanation same thing happened with solitary writer albert woodfox who being a black was in prison for i think 40 years or so in a single cell and they survived you can find the same story by the way in nelson mandela's but nelson mandela was not confined to a black room uh, without any uh, window or so on and then victor frankl uh, who suffered in the nazi germany camp all these people despite being in those very difficult circumstances personally 
have found a purpose in life and when you read their books you find there is a meaning in that there's a hope in that despite all these difficulties and that is possible because human mind can help us to cope with the challenges most disparate desperate situation and still find a purpose so the message from uh, this literature for me is that if you can find a purpose which is bigger than you find a meaning which is beyond the boundaries of your narrow boundaries of family and so on you would find that there is hope you can do great things in life so that is a big piece of uh, uh, learning for me when i read literature of people who have been through extremely difficult situation in life when it come out and actually inspired us uh, so that that's about uh, meaning uh, finally what do i summarize uh, I think I've been talking about connectedness. So Atlantic Campbell is the book which described the laying of cables under Atlantic. You know, we are able to talk today because some of these cables under the ocean are working. And when this book was published, people are, this is book written, um, uh, quite uh, old book now. And somebody wrote a poem and see how old the poem is and it would look like somebody's talking about today. It is done, the angry sea consents, the nations stand no more apart. With clasped hands, the con continents feel throbbings of each other's heart. Speed, speed the cable, let it run, a loving girdle around the earth, till all the nations neath, beneath the sun shall be as brothers of one hearth. Except that it is talking of brothers rather than sisters, I had no objection to the poem because it is again showing gender bias but but this is written in 17th 18th century and what it tells so this is a current global map of cables under the sea okay now this is what is making this talk possible and for you to hear to me or see to me okay these are these cables so it was a great adventure of mankind this is a cable which is between UK and US laid by Tata Telecoms. 13,000 kilometer long cable under the sea. And there are hundreds of thousands of kilometers. So what does this tell us? That we can connect. We can see ourselves as one community on this planet. Therefore, we need to be careful about what we do to ourselves. Otherwise, we can become uh, careless and bring the already difficult situation on climate we can precipitate this sooner than uh, it needs to be because we know end is we know our expiry date as a planet okay i can tell you today our expiry date is when sun collapses which is about you know four billion years from today so so earth will collapse it will go but that expiry date need not be brought forward and that is in our hand that is in your hand now i'd like to stop here thank you Thank you so much, Professor. It was quite a fascinating talk, and we really, really love to hear all this. You know, it was quite different from what we usually have in our webinars, and I'm really glad that you know we brought you here. So, uh, you know, uh, first of all, we'll take question. There was a question in the chat box. I'll simply read it out. Okay, so the question is from Shantanu Bombadkar. How to read and what to read, which would help in his overall growth. Yeah, uh, Kantanu, it's a, it's a very common but important question. Uh, I would say go with open mind. Okay, read different things and you don't need to finish every book that you start. So uh, my approach has been to start reading with the preface of the book. Generally, authors would write a preface if it's a nonfiction book. And uh, that gives you a sense of what purpose is because jacket doesn't necessarily tell you what is it. So you read the preface, it will tell you why book has been written, what is its uh, purpose. And then if you think that is a topic that you would like to read more, then go through the book. Otherwise, put to put it aside and read. Other thing is that when you find something interesting, uh, say, suppose it's a nonfiction book, then you should look into what that author has referred to. Okay. And from that list, you will find other books that are very interesting because you already found your uh, interest or taste and then you are going to deepen your taste in that. In the, non in the fictional books, it is difficult. Once you start liking something, then you try to find similar authors, read more of them. Uh, but go with open mind because uh, 
who knows which is the best book you will read might be next one i always feel my other the best book i will read will be my next one rather than saying well, i have already my read my best book so keep exploring uh, and don't be put off if you say i don't like this book after 10 pages put it away don't worry yeah that's absolutely right and i think most of us would you know face a similar situation where we you know um, don't feel like finishing up the book you know sometimes in middle of the book so uh, i think one should you know just focus on you know what's important and maybe leave it to that maybe not important to finish the book like you said okay so uh, any more questions you can type it in chat box or you can simply unmute yourself Okay, there's a question from Krupa. Uh, she's a very voracious reader. You know, she's our senior, and uh, yes, her, her question is: uh, recommend a fictional book that you know you might think that it's it's a must read for us all. Fictional books, there are many. I, I would uh, perhaps uh, uh, it's very difficult to choose one among many, isn't it? I, I first of all, I read less fiction than uh, this one. Non-fiction, but uh, William Golding's books are very good. Uh, he won Nobel in literature, so his books are good. Um, and then I'm looking at my uh, desk here. Recently, I, I um, started reading a book by a Polish writer. I'm figure forgetting her name, uh, which is uh, called The Flights. So it is her philosophical interpretation of various journeys she takes and then narrates it as a kind of a fictional account. Um, that is good. Um, um, I would also think of some uh, Russian authors, uh, Leo Tolstoy and, uh, and those which are very good books, uh, fiction wise. Um, Ian McKevin is again a very good writer. Um, his, his fiction is very good. Philip Pullman's fiction is very good, but that's more like science fiction. I mean, some of the science fiction stuff is fascinating. Wonderful, wonderful. So like, you know, being management students, you know, what do you think would be the best for, you know, students like us that we can, you know, relate with some management lessons? Yeah. Uh, there's a comment from Sweetie Roy here. Right, okay. Should I read it out? Yeah, no, I can read it here. Um, yeah, I mean, Bhagavad Gita, first of all, if you ask somebody to read, you must contextualize Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so Bhagavad Gita is 692 stanzas or verses from about 100,000 verses in Mahabharata. Okay, I remember that. It was extracted as a separate piece by, perhaps by Adi Shankar Acharya in 8th century uh, AD uh, from the from the 100,000 verses of Mahabharata and it's part of 18th chapter and so on. So, uh, for youngsters at an early age, uh, I don't think it makes sense because you need to understand that this is a dialogue between a person who has gone in depression Okay, Arjun is in depression. If you read the first slokes of Gita, it describes a classic case of somebody who is in depression, uh, who, who doesn't know that what to do when they are in middle of a situation where they will have to harm their family. And uh, so it's a dialogue of, it's, it's a kind of a semi-psychotherapic uh, book in the beginning when Krishna tries to to motivate him to fight for a cause, basically. And uh, so when you talk to a youngster and say, look, this is a dialogue of someone who was confused about what to do, but their duty as a soldier was this, but they were confused because of the attachment to family and so on. And then there's somebody goes along and tells them, look, that attachment is uh, fictional because people around you, people think that you are attached to are all a transient we are all transient but in this life now you have a purpose to defend whatever be that purpose so in this case it was justice 
and therefore you fight for justice uh, for your family and so on. So this is a dialogue between that kind of a, a student and a, and a teacher uh, in form of Arjuna and Krishna. Do you want to give that to a child? Then you narrate it in that sense rather than uh, the deep philosophical spiritual messages that people read from it, that what is the purpose of life and so on. So uh, if you tell them as a part of story, like then it is different thing. But if you tell them this is going to change your life uh, at young age, they may get really confused because you need to really understand what is Vedanta philosophy. This Gita is uh, uh, interpretation of a Vedantist. Okay, uh, Shankaracharya was the Vedantist uh, who, who was telling about Advait Vedant, the non-dualistic philosophy of life. Now, to explain to somebody non-dualism, you first need to tell them what is dualism. What two things are you talking about before you're talking about non-dualism? It goes back to Descartes' point, actually. But Descartes was a much, much uh, later. Uh, but this is about, you know, the sentient being that in this case humans and their relation with the nature. And the argument is that this the, behind the whole thing is uh, 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 Indian, one of the versions of Indian cosmological models that universe is one, there is nothing separate from it, including the living beings. And therefore, this concept of non-dualism, which is called Vedantic philosophy. Now, do you want to give it to an 80-year-old child? I'll leave it to you. Yes, right. Okay. So, any more questions? Okay, so just, you know, for, okay, how to prevent procrastination of reading books? <laughs> ah, there is a book on procrastination. Have you read that? <laughs> just Mitha. Uh, so, so, procrastination. Um, so let me read you. Uh, there's an entry in my diary here I was reading the other day, which is about procrastination. Uh, let me see if I can find that. Okay, so here I just here. This is literally reading from my uh, diary, written on twelfth of September, two thousand fourteen. The truth is, self-awareness can be painful. One desires to do a lot of things in life. Life also presents opportunities to do many of one's desired activities. The ever-present devils, not outside but inside, come in the way. Inside devils come in many forms. Procrastination is a symptom of living devils inside. Procrastinate is a secondary verb. It cannot exist without some other reason. Like a, a manifest illness is caused by some infection, bad habits infect, us, uh, infect our ability to act on desired goals. I want to write. I want to learn music. I want to get physical fitness and so on and so on. So I will add here, I want to read. I have done all the preparation when sleeping, devil awakes up, devil is wake up. What a good day to relax. Wouldn't a cup of coffee rejuvenate my success senses before I start my practice lesson? It is Friday evening. I had got whole of weekend to finish this task. Oh, I haven't spoken to that friend for ages. There is nothing like a good old chat over phone. The devil plays and are delighted when their host finally gives in to postpone important but not urgent task. So I don't know whether that answers your question, Jasmita. Yeah, I think it does. I mean, uh, you know, what I see is, what I feel is, you know, I just want to know what your opinion is. You know, I think our generation is uh, procrastinating a lot more than maybe your generation did. You know, because the kind yeah, of options... Is, you have to be uh, mindful. There's a beautiful book and it comes under emotional intelligence uh, literature, which is actually about attention. So, uh, Viktor Frankl says in search of meaning, 
that when there's a stipulation, you know, stimulation, so say you see a book, you want to read it, okay? Now, between that thought of, uh, between that desire to do something and to do something, there's a choice to be made, okay? Now, that choice can be punctured by some other thought, by some other distraction, right? So, uh, Fentel talks at a much deeper level saying that there's a pain, the sensation of pain and the experience of pain. You can choose how you respond to that pain. So similarly, when you have this stimulation to do something and before it is taken over by something else, uh, you had to be careful. So can you capture that fraction of that second before some other thought captures that? Okay, so there's a, a, a called mindfulness uh, activity, observe and then uh, be mindful that your brain will play trick. It will throw something else and then you need to then arrest it before it throws. So this is where a barrier actually might be useful, which is a difference between our ability to do and procrastinate. So if you are mindful of those barriers that mind throws, as I said, we get uh, 4,000 thoughts every day. And average thought is about 15 seconds. So, you know, you got that only few seconds before one thought is dominated by another. And learn to dominate during that period. Uh, and then say, I want to do it. And others are practical things like give yourself a target of reading um, 10 pages rather than thinking of finishing the book during the weekend. And that will take you a longer way than, you know, uh, committing to 50 pages every weekend. Yeah, that was wonderfully surmised. Uh, you know, uh, going back to the part of boundaries, you know, I saw some books, you know, Bay of Bengal and The Call of the Sea. So, you know, I also recently read a book named Darya Lal. It's a Gujarati book by Guru Mantra Acharya. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's such an amazing book. I mean, you know, one that I would, I would recommend to all people, you know, know how to read Gujarati. So, uh, that also explores the various adventures that, you know, our merchants bravely took, you know, in the past many, many centuries ago before even the British came here and so so I think uh, that's a must read you know how they crossed the boundaries and you know in looking for options that were not present over here in their motherland and you know exploring what the possibilities could be outside their world so mm. that is something very inspiring yeah yeah so it is book a uh, question about I think Gita is uh, again coming up you can read uh, Sweetie. there is no problem reading Gita I'm not saying don't read it I'm just saying that understand what it is so okay you need to th think of these uh, this literature in in a very clear that this literature was written by and for certain audiences uh, as an exploration of uh, our relationship with nature our relationship with ourselves our relationship with others and so on and what and whole idea is that that our what is the meaning of word um, uh, duty there. What's the, because there is no equivalent of word dharma in in English. Okay, dharma comes from dhra, which means uh, to support, which is which is also root of word dharti. So read that, but also I would suggest um, read around that literature, Vedantic or philosophical literature, so that you can understand rather than just uh, uh, you know, uh, interpret yourself. Critical thinking is very important. One of the beautiful words in, uh, it actually comes in uh, that literature called Vivek, means discrimination. And Shankaracharya wrote a book called Viveka Chudamani, uh, which is uh, ability to discriminate. This acquire that skill of asking questions, curiosity, and don't take things on face value. Try to experience yourself. Otherwise, the meaning is not lived, it is just memorized. That's true. Okay. So uh, one more thing I would like to, you know, point out to the audience is, you know, um, you have a wonderful habit of keeping a diary and, you know, I have observed even your past conversations when we were trying to fix this date for the webinar. And uh, I think that is one habit that I think all must have, you know, at the present time which you know, really helps in you know capturing those essential things that we come by in life you know yeah on that i would highly recommend for you those uh, i mean it's a, it's a practical skill you need to develop to manage your time and so on so there's a nice book let me see if i can find and show it to you on camera uh, this book the checklist 
uh, is very interesting book by Atul Gawande. Now, Atul is uh, fascinating. He's a doctor, works in US. And if you don't read uh, uh, about medical, uh, you say about fiction, I, I, I find real life so interesting. Uh, so Atul Gawande is uh, a very, very, very good writer. He's a medical practitioner and he writes about medical matters. So one of his serious books is about uh, medical, but this one is about getting things done, uh, you know. Now, I don't need to read, I have practice management for several years, but when I find something interesting, I pick it up and I read it and then, you know, if I don't like it, I'll put it aside. But this type of thing that we think we know all about smart working, efficient working, but actually there's always something new you can learn from anybody and one should be humble enough to learn from anyone, from, from any, any walk of life, I think. This is the beauty of reading diverse audience. So on leadership, of course, there are management theories, but I find some of the leaders in medical field, uh, imagine the doctor who is a brain surgeon, how do they monitor their emotions? How do they control their emotions? And how do they operate in operating theater? Now, some of them write fascinating stories about medical practice. And if you read that, you say, how does it apply to manager? How does it apply to me as a leader? So this is where Reading can be extremely helpful. One of the best, recently best books that I have written, uh, read on leadership is actually a history book. So this is a book called uh, uh, The Follies, uh, The March of Follies, okay? Uh, this book. Uh, now here, uh, Barbara Tuchman, uh, American writer, talks about the March of Folly. Now this March of Folly, Folly word means, uh, you know, overconfident mistakes, foolish things. Now this is a history which she's writing from um, for nearly 2000 year history, it talks about the Greek uh, kings and how they were overconfident. Then she comes into European leaders during Roman empire and then recent history until World War II that how American presidents were behaving in, in presence of all the evidence they were not taking rational decision or how people lie about these things and how rotten and corrupt the top can be. And once the top becomes corrupt, how the society collapses. Same, some of these things you find in corporate world also. So, so here is a book about history of uh, leadership, but it is written by a historian, not by a management expert. And it gives you a lot of things. So what you find are common things, hubris, overconfidence, a tendency to trust and uh, have you know, few people rather than uh, uh, critical friends. So uh, not giving voice to other people. Now these are important lessons you can learn from reading uh, from uh, what we will normally call management literature. Absolutely, wonderful. You know, I think we would uh, need a list of all the books that you have mentioned, you know, the, the viewers have also requested it. So it has been a very great uh, you know, collection of yours. So I think a lot of people would highly benefit from it. Okay. so. Uh, okay. Are there any more comments? Uh, no, though, there are no more questions, but okay. Maggie, Bam, Maggie Bam dropped a message you know, in between. She joined us and uh, then she had to go. So let me just uh, copy and paste the message so you don't have to scroll. Well, you know, just uh, you can send a message if you want me to convey anything. And. Uh, yeah, I mean, thank you to Margie. Very kind of her to leave that message. I read that. And obviously, I'll be delighted to connect with her. Sure. OK. So I think there are no more further questions. And uh, then we can wrap the session up. OK. So it has been my pleasure. Thank you for joining this uh, uh, evening for you all afternoon here. So uh, my very best, best wishes to all of you uh, in your success, uh, successful life and career. And, uh, thank you. Thank okay. you so much, sir. We have definitely enjoyed this session. It was, you know, far beyond what we expected, and totally something new, a very different perspective that we got from this session. And we certainly, you know, wish to carry a lot of things with us today. And I hope all the audience loved it. And uh, you know, looking forward to a very happy reading time. And you know, maybe someday we'll share our experiences, you know, with you. And Thank also, you. we would be very willing to, you know, welcome you physically at BK when you arrive in India. So yes. when the situation normalizes, we will be very happy to welcome you. Yes. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. See you.